Mercury, the most extreme inner planet. Mercury is a small, rocky, gray planet, which looks quite similar to the moon. But a closer examination reveals vast differences between them. Mercury is the most extreme of the inner planets. The first extreme of Mercury is its speed. It only takes Mercury 88 days to orbit the sun. That's the length of its year. It's the fastest planet in the solar system. But its day, however, is another matter. Mercury's rotational period is 59 Earth days. Rotational period is one way to define a day, though it's not the typical way we think about a day on Earth. The way we usually think of it is the time it takes for the sun to return to the same place in the sky. On Earth, this time and the rotational period are practically equal, so we don't usually think about the difference. On Mercury, however, the time it takes for the sun to reach the same place in the sky is two Mercury years, or 176 Earth days. That's a long time. Its orbital speed is where its name came from. It moves fast through the sky and is fairly bright, so Mercury was well known to many ancient people. Mercury is the Roman god who was the messenger for all the other gods, and being the messenger, he had to be fast. That's why the Greeks and Romans named the fastest moving planet after the fastest moving god. The Mercury only takes 88 days to orbit the Sun is the first extreme we find in Mercury. It is the fastest moon orbiting planet in our solar system. This is because it is closest to the Sun, and Kepler's third law, in non-mathematical terms, says that the closer a planet is to the Sun, the faster it orbits. Another extreme of Mercury is its size. Mercury is the smallest planet. It's so small that often size comparisons compare Mercury to the size of moons instead of only planets. There are two moons that are larger than Mercury. So why do we have a moon that's bigger than a planet? Well, we call them moons and not planets because they orbit planets instead of the sun. Ganymede here, moon of Jupiter, is the largest moon in the solar system. With a radius of 1,637 miles, it is 8% larger than Mercury. Mercury only has a radius of 1,516 miles. Jupiter is not the only planet with a larger moon than Mercury. Saturn has one too. Its name is Titan. Titan has a radius of 1,600 miles, which is 6% larger than Mercury. Titan is the only moon in the solar system known to have a thick atmosphere. The atmosphere is primarily nitrogen. Titan has lakes and rivers and rain, but not of water, of methane.
although Mercury is small, it is actually the densest planet in our solar system when you correct for self-compression. Mercury has a much larger density than the moon. This is because Mercury is mostly core. In fact, 60% of Mercury's mass is in its core. The core is a ball of iron and nickel the size of the moon. No wonder it is so heavy. But not only does Mercury have a large core, it also has a weak magnetic field. This suggests that part of Mercury's core is liquid. Magnetic fields are generated by moving electric charges and electrons in liquid metal can move easier than electrons in solid metal. One extreme of Mercury that you might have guessed is its temperature. Since Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, you'd think that it would be the hottest planet, but it's not. Venus, although almost twice as far away from the sun as Mercury, is hotter than Mercury. This is because Venus has a thick atmosphere and Mercury doesn't. If you could stand on the scorching surface of Mercury when it is at its closest point to the sun, the sun would appear more than three times as large as it does when viewed from Earth. Temperatures on Mercury's surface can reach 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Because the planet has no atmosphere to retain that heat though, nighttime temperatures on the surface can drop to 290 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. This makes Mercury the coldest terrestrial planet and the second hottest planet. Mercury is the least explored terrestrial planet. It has been visited by two spacecraft. The first one was Mariner 10, launched in 1973. It did not orbit Mercury, but instead did three flybys of it. On the way there, it also flew, flew by Venus, using it for a gravity assist. The first ever gravity assist done on the way to a planet by a spacecraft. Mariner 10 imaged about 45% of Mercury's surface. It carried out seven scientific experiments. The television photography system, consisting of two telescopes to image the planets, an infrared radiometer to calculate the temperature of Venus's atmosphere and Mercury's surface, an ultraviolet spectrometer, primarily to detect any atmosphere around Mercury, plasma detectors to study the solar wind inside the orbit of Venus for the first time, a charged particle telescope to study cosmic radiation, magnometers to detect any magnetic field around Venus and Mercury, and a celestial mechanics and radio science experiment to investigate Venus and Mercury's mass and gravitational characteristics. As the spacecraft passed behind Mercury, its radio signals were used to determine if the planet had an atmosphere and precisely measure its radius. By precisely tracking the spacecraft's trajectory as it passed Mercury, the planet's mass and gravitational characteristics could be determined. Mariner 10 lifted off from Cape Canaveral, Florida on November 3rd, 1973 to begin its journey to Venus and Mercury. The spacecraft passed within 3,500 miles of Venus on February 5th, 1974, returning more than 4,000 images and contributing significantly to an understanding of the planet, of the cloud shrouded planet during its flyby. But Venus's most important contribution 
to the mission was the gravity assist it provided to alter Mar Mariner 10's trajectory and send it on its way to Mercury. Mission planners chose the trajectory in such a way that the encounter with Mercury would occur when the planet was at its furthest point from the sun in its elliptical orbit so that Mariner 10 would not have to travel any closer to the sun than necessary to reduce the risk of overheating. In another bit of trajectory planning, Professor Beppe Colombo at a university in Italy determined that Mariner 10 could be placed in such an orbit that it would re-encounter Mercury every 176 days, exactly twice the time it takes the planet to orbit around the sun. Amid course correction on March 16th, we find the spacecraft's trajectory for optimum science measurements during the first Mercury encounter. The first instruments were activated the next day and the first images of the planet were returned one week later. These initial pictures displayed about the same amount of detail as photographs taken from Earth, but as the spacecraft approached the planet, the pictures began to reveal surface features. On March 29th, Mariner 10 passed only 438 miles above Mercury's surface and continued to photograph the planet until April 3rd, by which time it had returned more than 2,000 images, as well as a wealth of data from its other scientific instruments. At first glance, Mercury appeared very moon-like with a heavily cratered surface, but overall, the planet's surface features showed less contrast than our satellite. Other features, such as scarps or cliffs present on Mercury, are absent on the moon and hint at the planet's formation. Mercury also has Mari, or flat plane-like features, like the moon and Mars, possible clues to similar planetary ancestries in terms of bombardment by asteroids. Somewhat surprisingly, Mariner 10's magnometer detected a weak magnetic field, about 1 60th the strength of Earth's. Radio tracking of the spacecraft's trajectory revealed Mercury to me much closer to being a perfect sphere than Earth. Mariner 10 went on to make two more successful flybys of Mercury. The third encounter took place on March 16, 1975, but not without some drama in the days leading up to it. Mariner 10, already running low on attitude control fuel, rolled out of communication with Earth. Controllers scrambled to get time on tracking antennas to regain control of the spacecraft and succeeded just in time for the encounter. This time, the flyby distance was only 203 miles above the surface, with the main goals to study the planet's magnetic field and to date more detailed imagery of sites of interest identified from the first two encounters. About 450 narrow strips of photographs were taken, some with a surface resolution down to about 450 feet. Eight days later, Mariner 10 depleted its attitude control fuel and mission controllers sent a signal to turn the spacecraft off. This brought to an end the flight operations of a highly successful mission that essentially explored two planets for the price of one and completed four encounters for the price of two. Scientists continue to analyze the data returned by Mariner 10 for many years. The discoveries at Venus and especially at Mercury added a great deal to our knowledge of the inner solar system. Unanswered questions would have to await the arrival of later spacecraft, such as, as NASA's MESSENGER that studied Mercury while orbiting it between 2011 and 2015, and the Be Bepi Colombo mission, a joint European Space Agency and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency project currently en route to Mercury and expected to enter orbit around the planet in 2025. 
after Mariner 10, we sent Messenger to Mercury. I'm going to let the scientist who worked on Messenger tell you about it themselves. Messenger is the first mission to the planet Mercury in more than 30 years. And only one mission, only one spacecraft, has ever visited Mercury. That was Mariner 10 back in the 1970s. Mariner 10 made some very important discoveries, but it left unanswered many first-order questions about the innermost planet. Mariner 10 saw less than half the planet with its imaging system. It discovered its magnetic field, but it didn't answer the question of why Mercury should have a magnetic field when larger planets have lost theirs. Mariner 10 made no measurements that told us much about the composition of Mercury. So for 30 years, the planetary science community has been working, uh, trying to answer these questions raised by Mariner 10, and Messenger has been designed to answer those questions. So even the first flyby in January 2008 is going to reveal to us uh, new discoveries. We're going to see about half of the part of Mercury that Mariner 10 never viewed with its imaging system. We're going to fly closer to Mercury than Mariner 10 ever got, so we'll get a much better view of the magnetic field, of the atmosphere. Uh, we're going to be carrying uh, chemical remote sensing instruments, so by the time we get into orbit and have a chance to in integrate the observations from those instruments, we'll be doing maps of the composition of Mercury. So we're just going to get a global view for the first time and uh, a host of answers to questions that have been uh, ones that planetary scientists have been pondering ever since Mariner 10 for more than 30 years. When we get to Mercury for the Mercury 1 flyby, um, we have a number of science objectives that date all the way back to the beginning of the program. We said during the Mercury flybys, we want to map most of the planet. We want to get good set, a good set of color images to look at the slight color variations amongst the various parts of the Mercury surface. We want to look with the spectrometer. You can think of it as the camera tells you the overall design and uh, structure. The spectrometer tells you something about the mineral composition and the atomic composition of the atmosphere. It's a very, very thin atmosphere called an exosphere at Mercury. Um, Mercury does have a magnetic field and the energetic particles and magnetic field instruments will be looking at the size and structure of that magnetosphere and trying to understand how it interacts with the sun and the solar wind. The um, laser altimeter will try to make the first measurements of reflections off the Mercury surface and get some details of how rough and what the variations are in that surface. And the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer and the X-ray spectrometer, those instruments can best look at the atomic composition of the minerals in the surface. So the camera tells you the overall structure the um, masks, um, atmospheric and surface composition spectrometer tells you about the minerals and some of the atomic composition in the atmosphere, gamma rays, neutrons, and uh, x-rays tell you more about the atomic composition of the surface. So what atoms make up these minerals that the mask spectrometer can see? put that all together and then you have a good idea of what the overall structure of mercury is. One thing I realized early on in, in, in the mission is that this was really a, an opportunity of a career, an opportunity of a lifetime, because it's the last major planet in our solar system that we had not extensively explored. It was the last opportunity to really do new frontier exploration in our solar system. And I'll never forget the night of the first flyby of Mercury. And on that night, it was at midnight Eastern time when the images were coming down. And the science team was gathered there 
because it was the first data that was going to come down from Mercury in almost three decades. And I remember gathering around the projector and seeing those images come up, and there were like 25 of us in the room, and it was just total silence as we were looking at that and realized that nobody had ever seen this before. This was totally you know, terra incognito. You know, I'll never have that experience again. All the measurements we did of the chemical composition with our X-ray spectrometer, with our gamma ray spectrometer, with our neutron spectrometer were new, new things, never been done. Uh, we were able to do imaging down to resolutions 10, 100, more than 100, times better than anything Mariner 10 had done. And of course, we were measuring the magnetic field every day. We were measuring the shape of the planet with an altimeter. Uh, we're looking into the polar craters. We're discovering landforms on the surface that Mariner 10 just didn't have the resolution to see. When you make an unexpected discovery, it, it makes you feel like an excited kid. You know, it's Halloween. You know, I'm, you know, I've got a big bag of candy. It's very, very exciting when you make a new discovery and you realize, one, I mean, this is just brand new. And two, it's not what I expected which is always more interesting than finding what you expected. Mercury has a lot of very interesting geological features. Got hollows, water ice, volcanoes, lava flows, tectonic activity, um, as well as a magnetic field. And so I'm going to show you several videos by the messenger scientists about these different features. I can't properly talk about the geology on Mercury without mentioning the largest geological feature on Mercury, and that is the Caloris Basin. That's this huge crater here. It's got a diameter of 950 miles, and it is ringed by mile-high mountains. So it's a large feature. Inside of it, you can see some craters that were made after the large impact that, um, that formed the Caloris Basin. Let's kind of drive around and see some of these really interesting features. Cracks. You can see the craters have nice peaks on the inside of them. The terrain is rougher over here. It's quite an interesting feature. This image is an enhanced color composite overlaying a black and white um, image. And it shows off the different topology, but also the different chemical composition of the um, Chloris Basin. The, what's colored orange in this image is lava. And then you can see that those craters that struck afterwards, when some of them struck deep enough that they brought up um, other material that had been covered up by the lava. And that's the blue. So the purplish blue, that's low reflectance material which was probably the original basin floor before 
It was covered up by the lava. Those are something that we're still we're still investigating, even as we go through the through the uh, second extended mission and into XM2 Prime, trying to look for uh, more evidence of exactly what causes these really funny looking geological constructs called hollows, which look for all the world like perhaps these are some sort of blowouts of volatile materials. There's the suggestion that whatever that these things are and whatever processes were involved that they've happened in much more recent history than whatever was going on molding the rest of the planet. But um, you know, some of the things that molded the rest of the planet are, are a billion or two billion or three billion years old. Back in the days of Mariner 10, where we had images of the, the planet, but from um, much lower resolution, um, they knew of several craters usually where it just looked brighter. These craters have big collections of brightish, bluish stuff, but we didn't have the resolution to see what it was. And even from the flybys, the three flybys of, of Mercury, we saw more of these craters and got a better spectral signature and, you know, where are they on the planet? But they, we still call them BCFDs, so we call them Bright Crater Floor Deposits. And it wasn't until we got into orbit and could get some of the higher resolution images um, of the Northern Hemisphere that we started to see what are these BCFDs. And because we knew where a lot of them were, we could target these areas. Sander Crater is a great example. It's up in Caloris. And when we got high resolution views back of Sander, the floor of the crater just looked amazing. It had all of these crazy shaped irregular depressions and it had this bright material outside of it. And you know, to this day, we don't fully know what causes them. A lot of them are associated with this material that we've been calling low reflectance material, or again, an acronym, LRM. It's often associated with larger impact craters, so we think it came from depth. So it took some big object to come slam into the planet, and then ejecta comes out of that hole that it makes, and it comes from way underground. Mercury doesn't have seasons, right? Earth has seasons because it's tilted on its axis. Uh, Mercury is basically straight up and down, almost perfectly. Because of that, if you have a hole at either the North or South Poles, you will have an area where the sun never gets in there. The sun can never get into that crater. And so even though it's, you know, relatively speaking, right next to the sun, it gets very hot during the day, these places of permanent shadow stay very, very cold. There's no atmosphere to conduct or convect heat around. And so thermally, yeah, you could expect some water ice to be there. The radar data suggested it. It's in these areas where you don't expect sunlight. So all signs were suggestive of water ice, but that's about where it stood after Mariner 10. Um, one of Messenger's goals was to try to um, elucidate more information about these polar deposits. What is it? And we've actually been able to get more information about these things from multiple instruments. And it was kind of neat. A lot of these lines of evidence kind of came together at the same time. Uh, we've been in orbit for, you know, three plus years. And uh, yeah, we've imaged 100% of the planet. Now, there are some shadows that are hard to see into. And there's some other parts. But we've taken images that have covered that part of the planet. But for the polar regions, there's parts that are permanently shadowed. The sun never shines there. But what we've been doing actually in the extended mission is we used the filter that we use to look for stars, which is very, very sensitive. If you use this filter and you take an image of the surface of the planet, it's completely saturated. It's way overexposed. It's white, it's washed out. But using that filter and looking at those permanently shadowed regions, you have enough sensitivity to start to resolve the features even within those permanent shadows. And these surfaces that uh, look bright, actually we think are surface water ice on the planet. So we've taken images of what we think is water ice exposed, which is a bit crazy because Mercury is really close to the sun. It's the closest planet to the sun. And yet here on the surface in these permanently shadowed regions, we have images that support the idea that that's water ice on this planet. A neutron spectrometer measures neutrons, and the number of neutrons at different energies tell you information about the composition. And especially for messenger, the prime reason for using neutrons is they're a very good indicator of the presence of hydrogen. 
and it's the idea is a neutron and a hydrogen atom have the same mass and so when a neutron's rattling around and it finds a hydrogen atom it loses its energy really quickly it's just like playing billiards so when you hit the cue ball and it hits the other ball dead on it stops it's the same idea and so when you're having a detector on the messenger spacecraft that detects neutrons and you're flying around the indicator of hydrogen is a decrease in the number of neutrons that you find and it's almost a unique indicator and so that was the whole purpose of testing the hypothesis of what's going on at the poles is it hydrogen is it water ice could it be sulfur is it something else well we need to know is it hydrogen and if you see an enhancement of hydrogen at the poles which would be indicated by a decrease in the number of neutrons you know that's your smoking gun to say aha there's there's a lot of hydrogen there it's likely water ice and then there was some of the bonus measurements uh, from the uh, laser altimeter which was able to look at the reflectance of these regions and you saw indications that have some places water ice is uh, likely stable on the surface and other locations where there's really dark material that tells you well it's probably water ice type of materials with maybe carbon rich other constituents and so it's a story that really hangs together water ice is is, is present at the poles of mercury there's a lot of evidence for pyroclastic volcanism which is explosive volcanism and and there's a one particular patch of this stuff that's that's brighter than the surrounding material and uh, we were able to measure the chemical composition of this with the x-ray spectrometer that we could only do with this pointed uh, opportunity and extended mission and what we learned was that unlike the rest of the planet this material has less sulfur than the surrounding material and we think this is telling us that sulfur is the element that's driving these volcanic explosions and the sulfur is vaporizing for some reason in some volcanoes and so the sulfur itself is lost and then the lavas have no no uh, sulfur. So it's the first direct measurement of the composition of a volcano on another planet, another terrestrial planet. So it's very exciting. One of the outstanding questions we have is how did Mercury's crust get there and what's it made of? And we have evidence that we've had a lot of flood volcanism on Mercury. All that is, is an enormous volume of lava pouring onto the surface relatively quickly, geologically instantaneously. And we see certain parts of the planet today that we know were formed in this way. So a long standing question is, what of the rest of the planet? Was it formed in that same way? And can we use what we see in the most recent lava fields to tell us about how the other portions of the planet were formed. The question is whether this is episodic or whether it's simply what it did for a very long time and then it eventually waned off. I'm not sure we have enough information to say yet which one of those it was, but I think we can say that a huge volume of Mercury's crust, at least, was put down by flood volcanism. Enormous volumes of lava pouring all over the surface, building up tens of hundreds of kilometers thick of material through the volcanic process. We know it's hot inside today because Mercury has a magnetic field and the only way we can explain that is that there's molten metal inside the planet. For that to happen, it has to be very, very hot. However, like anything, if you're not producing heat at the same rate you're losing it to space, like Earth is, then you're going to cool down. You're going to have a net cooling through time. And as you cool, your volume decreases and you contract. And that's what made Mercury contract. Now, an interesting question we have is, if you contract a planet, you squeeze shut its upper surface. You make it really hard to get lava onto the surface. But we have all these observations of a planet covered in lava. So a long-standing question that we've been trying to answer is, how do you volcanically resurface a planet that's contracting? And that's part of the work we're doing. How much a planet contracts is related to how much its temperature has changed as a function of time. One of the most interesting things about Mercury uh, that we didn't really expect is the composition of the surface material. Now, we knew that the competing theories for how Mercury was assembled differed in the composition we would find. We took several instruments that were very well designed to do chemical assays of the surface and how the composition varied over different geological units. 
The only thing we knew before we went to Mercury was the planet is extraordinarily dense. For such a small body to be as dense as Mercury is, it has to be mostly iron. Because iron is the only common element in the sun and in meteorites that is of sufficient density. All of the theories for how Mercury was assembled to end up so metal rich predicted that the elements easily lost at high temperature, what the chemists call volatile elements, should be severely depleted in Mercury. Now, we started measuring the abundances of volatile elements. Potassium, sulfur, sodium, most recently chlorine, alkali metals, uh, halogens, sulfur itself is often uh, a volatile species, and they were abundant on the surface of Mercury. Uh, sulfur 10 times more abundant than the surface of the Earth. Sodium and potassium uh, as abundant as on Mars relative to less volatile elements, same with chlorine. It means that none of the theories that had been advanced to account for the formation of Mercury, and by inference, the differences in composition of the inner planets, uh, could have been correct. So we had to go back to the drawing board, go back to the beginning, and think through the formation of the inner planets to account for a scenario in which Mercury not only ended up with a high fraction of metal, but also accumulated substantial abundances of these elements that are lost at high temperatures, these volatile elements. Mercury is really special because it has this larger fraction of iron to non-iron, basically rock, okay? And so if we look at the other planets, the Earth, Mars, the Moon, uh, Venus, they have much smaller fractions by mass and by volume of iron in their interior relative to the amount of rock they have. So understanding things about uh, what types of elements are also on the surface can tell us about things in the interior and all of those are related in some way to how the planet was assembled. This is an end member of our solar system. And uh, you know, it's the innermost planet. Any model that tries to explain the formation of all the planets, and especially the terrestrial planets, has to explain Mercury. And now we know a lot more about it. But probably more importantly, it tells us a lot about our own world. Because we're missing 95% of Earth's history. We have plate tectonics and oceans and vegetation and atmosphere and the hydrological cycle. And as a result, we have most of Earth's history gone. So if we want to understand what our world was like early in its day, we have to look to other worlds, Mars, Mercury, Venus, other planets and other solar systems. By understanding the universe around us, we get a much better understanding of our own world, and we might even get a sense of where our own world is going in future. Mercury is at the frontier of understanding how solar systems form. So if being human and being in a human society means anything, it means being curious, and it means exploring. So fundamentally, that's what it's about. It's about pushing the boundaries of human understanding. And there's a very popular model called the Grand Attack model that now has Jupiter forming where it is and then moving into the inner solar system and then moving out. And this, this can explain a lot of properties of the asteroid belt and the outer planets and the mass of Mars. But this model doesn't explain Mercury because they weren't really thinking about it and because we didn't know that much about Mercury. Now we have a whole other planet that has to be integrated into these kind of big scale models of the formation of the solar system. We will wrap up Mercury, the most extreme inner planet, with a movie from the Messenger team members where they recount some highlights of the mission. It was midsummer 2004 when Messenger launched from Space Launch Complex 17B at Cape Canaveral, Florida, five years after being selected as a NASA Discovery mission. Main engine start, two, 
one and zero and liftoff of Messenger on NASA's mission to Mercury. The spacecraft lifted off just after two in the morning, well before the sun rose to heat up the Florida coastline. Not that the 90 degree plus afternoon temperatures would have been an issue, considering Messenger was on an 80 month trip to one of the hottest places in our solar system. We knew the Mercury would pose uh, severe environmental challenges to a spacecraft. Uh, Mercury is the planet closest to the sun. The sun itself is the source of heat. The day side of the planet is the source of substantial heat as well because it gets heated by the sun. And the inner solar system is bathed in high radiation coming from the sun on a regular basis and then episodically as, as the sun goes through storms and solar energetic particles are released and coronal mass ejections are released. And any spacecraft that's in the way has to be able to withstand all those. The original mission plan was to orbit the planet for one year, but thanks to the amazingly resourceful messenger engineering team, it orbited Mercury for over four years. Everything that we do in the solar system has engineering challenges, some larger than others. And I think going to Mercury is probably one of the biggest challenges we've ever done on a discovery budget. And they did it marvelously. The Discovery Program is meant to really challenge the community to, to come up with fabulous ideas, fabulous processes, and fabulous uh, spacecraft to be able to do things that we can only dream of today. That requires teams of tremendous expertise. So the, the APL crowd, man, they've got all kinds of expertise, both engineering and scientific. They have a huge and enormous depth. Mission and spacecraft systems engineer Dan O'Shaughnessy is responsible for all technical aspects of the MESSENGER mission. Getting into orbit about Mercury is, is very, very challenging just because it's moving so fast and you have to get down close to Mercury, which is already difficult to do, and then you have to hit the brakes in such a way that will allow you to capture in orbit. At the time of launch, we were more than 50% fuel. We were essentially, in some ways, a flying gas can. So that sort of gives you some indication of the difficulty just um, accomplishing the trajectory that is necessary to get you into orbit. And so it was very gratifying to see that once we got into orbit from an engineering perspective, you know, things were lining up with the models very nicely and that the spacecraft was capable of handling this environment. Beyond that, once we got into orbit and we had a little bit of additional propellant in our back pocket, we could use that to make changes to the trajectory that we didn't even anticipate at the time of launch. And so we had a robust design for the vehicle because a whole bunch of really capable people worked on this vehicle and its design and over-designed it in some sense that allowed us to operate in environments that we hadn't even originally anticipated. We could reduce the orbit period, reduce the amount of time that we were able to cool the spacecraft but we were still robust to all that, and it allowed us to capture scientific observations that we didn't imagine at the time of launch. That little bit of additional propellant in our back pocket he referred to was a result of even more engineering wizardry by the team. One of the mission controllers came up with the method of using the solar arrays as a solar sail and thereby conserving fuel, and I believe he got an award for that effort because it was a fantastic, fantastic concept and he proved that it'll work. To me, I view it as a recognition of the team. It's, it's not anything I did personally, it's the environment that I'm in at APL, that our management allows a culture of innovation, allows us to take risks, fosters this level of creativity. And then I really just happen to be at the right place at the right time. The confluence of a bunch of different um, ideas and uh, constraints that led to this uh, idea of solar sailing. So the engineers have been fantastic in preserving uh, the, the life of the spacecraft and making the mission last as long as it did. Basically used the solar arrays as sails, like sails on a sailboat, which helped us to correct the trajectory a little bit over time. But as you travel through the solar system, a little bit of uh, pressure applied over a long time corrected the path to Mercury quite substantially. This is where all the extended missions came, came in from, the, from this preservation of fuel and uh, the margins that we are now looking at uh, allowed us to extend the mission by, by the extra four weeks that, uh, that we're looking for at XM2 Prime. What we do when we create a mission concept is we have a set of things that we want to know. 
And those are the mission objectives. And in a discovery program, uh, we really try to focus on a few key objectives. The real gold comes from the fact that you can get into orbit, you can actually make those measurements, do the science that answers the questions we want to know, and then uncover a whole plethora of other things that we want to do. And that's why when our spacecraft get into position and are still healthy, beyond what we call their prime mission, we are highly motivated to, to keep them going because we then learn so much more about uh, you know, Mercury in this case. We started to see almost a whole new mission emerge because we're getting lower than we were ever planning to get. So the resolution of our data are increasing, for example. We're getting new insights, stuff we couldn't hope to see. We're already finding really interesting stuff at better resolutions than we ever did before. But none of that was in the original plan for Messenger. This is essentially Messenger part two because we're getting this new view of Mercury that we didn't have any right to expect we would. And that's incredible. And it's, it's a testament to the science and operation teams of Messenger who did such a wonderful job of planning this. This uh, has been spectacularly successful. For example, we were able to measure the composition of a volcanic deposit, the largest deposit of pyroclastic volcanism on the planet. And so there's a lot of evidence for pyroclastic volcanism, which is explosive volcanism. And there's one particular patch of this stuff that's, that's brighter than the surrounding material. We were able to measure the chemical composition of this with the X-ray spectrometer that we could only do with this pointed opportunity and extended mission. And what we learned was that Unlike the rest of the planet, this material has less sulfur than the surrounding material. And we think this is telling us that sulfur is the element that's driving these explosive volcanic explosions. We see evidence of places now that look like lava flows. It looked like that they must have been flowing uphill, which means that uh, that didn't really happen. What it meant that those flows that took place, that they solidified, and then there were other things that were going on that were modifying the long wavelength topology of the planet. The newer volcanic uh, features are probably a billion years old. This is nothing that's been going on recently. On the other hand, uh, what we have discovered were the so-called hollows, which look for all the world like, you know, perhaps these are some sort of blowouts of uh, volatile materials. And those are something that we're still investigating even as we go through the second extended mission and into XM2 Prime, trying to look for more evidence of exactly what causes these really funny looking geological constructs. The science return has been excellent with the number of images far exceeding initial estimates. When we were writing the original proposal for the Messenger mission in 1996, a long time ago, we estimated that we get about a thousand pictures of mercury down. And that was enough to say, this could be a really good mission. But the reality is along the way, we developed a number of new technologies so that when we realized the true mission, we now have over 250,000 images down. So we have dramatically improved the amount of science information we've been able to bring down from this mission mostly because we have some really good engineers who came up with really inventive ways of improving the insight into Mercury. Sometimes taking images just at different times of day, you'll cover more of the planet that way and you know you can get the terrain when it's illuminated from the east or from the west and that'll, that'll um, show you what you're seeing. But for the polar regions, there's parts that are permanently shadowed. The sun never shines there, so you can take images from every possible direction and there's not, they're never gonna be sunlit on the interiors. But what we've been doing actually in the extended mission is we used the filter that we use to look for stars, which is very, very sensitive. If you took, if you use this filter and you take an image of the surface of the planet, it's completely saturated. It's way overexposed, it's white, it's washed out. But using that filter and looking at those permanently shadowed regions, you have enough sensitivity to start to resolve the features even within those permanent shadows. So that's been a very exciting campaign that we've done in the extended mission. So we think that the very bright regions are indeed water ice, exposed right at the surface. And the very dark areas are, according to the neutron spectrometer, also water ice, but buried by something that's 20 or 30 centimeters thick an insulating blanket. What is that material? That material is only seen where the temperature is cold. Not so cold as to have water ice stable at the surface, but still colder than most of mercury. So it's a volatile. It's something that is lost at high temperatures. But it's darker than anything on mercury. It's darker than the 
any of the darkest places elsewhere on Mercury. So it's not Mercury soil, or it's not Mercury rock, it's something else. And it's lost at medium temperatures. And so that, that led to the idea that this stuff was delivered to Mercury by the same objects that delivered the water ice, probably comets or volatile rich asteroids. What we know from analyzing the spectra of small objects in the outer solar system, which are very, very dark, or from analyzing the chemistry of meteorites that are thought to come from asteroids and maybe some from comets, is that they do have some very dark material in them matching the low reflectance of this stuff on Mercury. But it's organic material. It's carbonaceous material. So we verified the hypothesis that Mercury has water ice in these deep freeze areas of permanent shadow at the poles, but we made this additional discovery. It's also got organic material. It's got water. It's got organic material. We think of these as the building blocks of life on Earth delivered probably from outer parts of the solar system. We've got a record on Mercury, the planet closest to the sun of this delivery process, not at the beginning of the solar system, but at a more recent phase. But it's relatively unmodified. It's extraordinarily well preserved. And it may be a record of the kind of stuff that was delivered to our own planet before life began. So it, it makes Mercury even a more interesting body for future exploration than it was before we went there. Messenger showed that it's possible to do something that close to the sun. Others are now following, expanding the range of science they can do. The European Space Agency, ESA, and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, have the Bepi Colombo mission launching to Mercury in a couple of years and arriving in 2024. But how long before we get that ever important surface sample that scientists crave? Is putting a lander on Mercury even possible? The trick is being able to slow down, get into orbit, and land. So you got to carry a lot of fuel with you. Um, that would enable you to actually get to Mercury and land. Technically, it's within reach, and uh, doing that scientifically probably be very worthwhile because it would give us those next pieces of information about understanding how the interior part of the solar system came together, and that helps to inform us better about how we ended up on our little pale blue dot that we live on. We've really brought Mercury up to the level of understanding of, of its sister planets in the inner solar system for the first time and accomplished a lot more than even our most optimistic expectations back in 1996. When you're doing things for the first time, I mean, you can go home and tell your kids that you created history today. And that's a, a terrific uh, source of inspiration for our engineering teams, but especially for our team here at APL. After more than four years in orbit, nearly 11 years in flight, and after 19 years since its conception, on April 30th, 2015, Messenger exhausted its fuel and crashed into Mercury's surface. We are calling it end of mission for Messenger. This has been a fantastic achievement. Uh, we go down in the history books for science and for space exploration. You guys are all part of it. Thank you for participating. Thank you very much.